And this is uh, by Peter Forrester, speaking about decomposition of measures and random matrix theory applied to number theory and integral geometry. I've um, clicked my microphone on and have quite a, a wild echo here. Uh, why is that? Uh, try over here. Mm. Still got an echo, but... Uh, <laughs> we, we don't hear the echo. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. Right. Take two. All right, take two. Yeah, the echo's uh, gone, and I'll um, resume. Uh, ten years ago, I was fortunate. Well, I was going to start by thanking the organisers, uh, particularly Alice and, and Ivan, and the, in the background, uh, Alexi. Uh, ten years ago, I was lucky enough to be in uh, the state of Utah for a um, meeting organised by the Random Matrix Community. Uh, I think Gino uh, had something to do with that uh, meeting. Um, one of the participants was uh, Ballant Varag. Ballant was um, talking about his newly introduced uh, Brownian motion um, model relating to the beta ensembles. And um, he wanted to explore beta dependent uh, quantities. And uh, he asked a particular question, a question of Alexi, and Alexi passed uh, the question on, or Ballant over to me, to perhaps um, uh, say something about this question. So this question is, goes back. Uh, to the times of uh, Maytar and Dyson. Well, it's actually a theorem from their earlier papers where they consider the circular ensemble, uh, the beta equals one with two endpoints, circular orthogonal ensemble. So with the two endpoints, the eigenvalues on the circle. Now, I didn't keep count there. Have I got an even number? Well. <laughs> We'll find out. Um, if one integrates out every second eigenvalue, we get left with a new point process. And the theorem of um, Mater and Dyson is that every second eigenvalue, the operation they introduce there is alt, is actually equal to the PDF, defining as, a, as an eigenvalue PDF, the circular symplectic ensemble. So that's going between beta equals one and beta equals four. And I was very interested in these sorts of uh, interrelations. And uh, what Ballant asked was, let's suppose we take, now that we've got particular interest in, in general beta, let's suppose we don't restrict to just the classical values here, one and four. We take another beta, and um, you know, the simplest example would be, can we find a value of beta such that if we integrate over uh, two eigenvalues in a row and observe the third, integrate two in a row, observe the third, integrate two in a row, observe the third, is there a uh, interrelationship between a certain um, circular beta ensemble. Um, we have to nominate what, what beta is here. We will have uh, three n eigenvalues. And the answer is, in fact, there is. And uh, the interrelation goes between beta and uh, four on beta. Well, this is um, when beta in, in this uh, setting, what's it going to be? So. I've got to get my values correct here, so we're going to have um, uh, beta. The usual interrelation is between uh, two on beta, and um, and so we've got beta equals one. It's going to go. Let's excuse this uh, slightly impromptu, but uh, I won't continue. But to say that um, we can find a beta value that for this relationship to actually hold. We can find a beta value that if we integrate out three eigenvalues in succession, we can find another, there we would have a four n to n, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that actually came out of discussions in a, in a uh, conference like this, and I think that's uh, one of the great uh, advantages of uh, 
having uh, people together and uh, hearing about different perspectives. So um, at a technical level, it's also of interest, um, how can one make a contribution of this sort? Well, I have um, my own technical tools. My technical tools were working with Solberg type integrals. So I knew how to actually perform integrations over these sort of domains that are very popular in studying um, models relating to um, Scher processes, McDonald processes, et cetera, where we have interlacings. And I, I knew of such integrations, and I knew that perhaps one could extend this with values of beta, although it wasn't obvious at the time, how to break away from structures that are special to beta equals one, a determinental structure that appears there, how to break away from that. But it was possible to get to, um, extended beta. So here, this would be actually thinking of it, beta equals six. And um, on, on this side, well, I think we go down to a third, but I'll, I'll double check that afterwards. But it's certainly a theorem. It's a theorem that holds for finite n, and it's something that came out of, um, out of the um, discussions here 10 years ago. Hopefully, as uh, Percy Diaconis um, said, I will try and pose some questions where I'm at in this present line of study where I'm a little bit stuck on, on some points and um, maybe I can get some advice that will, uh, will um, help me out. So let me uh, talk about uh, the material for today. The material for today is a little bit ambitious. Um, less is better, so I perhaps won't um, continue on to the very last dot point, but I will um, give an indication of uh, why I'm interested in that very last dot point. So let me uh, get underway. Problems in number theory and uh, integral geometry are not necessarily mainstream at uh, random matrix uh, conferences. It is a particular line that we could follow if we were to take an historical perspective and ask where do certain studies within random matrix theory show themselves. And uh, if we want one was to actually start off with the work of Hurwitz, one would actually be giving a talk of this sort. So I did start off with the work of Hurwitz. Uh, I found a um, collaborator in that uh, pursuit, Percy Deconis over there, and um, wanted to explore further that particular lineage. And uh, th this is what comes out of such a, uh, such a study. So I will uh, talk about three particular problems. Concrete problems. So the first one will actually be counting matrices with integer entries and determine it equal to one. So they form a group. Um, the simplest example, two by two case, SL2Z. How many matrices are there with a bounded norm when that norm gets large? That's an asymptotic counting question. And it turns out that question can be answered through notions of random matrix theory. The uh, second uh, question I'll inquire about is to do with a random lattice. A random lattice is defined by taking a basis chosen with uniform measure, and I'll explain what uniform measure means. So take this again, just take the two by two case. We're just considering two vectors, linearly independent. We're going to form now the integer span of those two vectors. That will give us a lattice. We've defined the lattice as the integer span of our two given vectors. Within that particular lattice, there'll be a smallest vector and a second smallest linearly independent vector. And the question we'd like to ask is, what is the actual statistical properties of that smallest vector and that second smallest vector? And that is, again, a question that can be answered through notions in random matrix theory. The third problem that I'd like to discuss is one of statistical properties of the convex hull. So Santa, uh, sitting over there, Majinda has studied uh, convex hulls relating to Brownian motions. What I'd like to uh, talk about is convex hulls, for example, as a concrete, ex concrete example, take three points in a disk at uniform, uniformly, form a triangle, and ask about the statistical properties of that triangle. How does one actually uh, perform calculations like that? That would be my last topic if I had to had time, so let's uh, proceed. This is uh, the first motivating question, asymptotic counting problem. As I say, very concrete. If we just think in the two by two case, we're asking ourselves how many matrices are there that have some bounded norm? 
And notions in random matrix theory are relevant because of an asymptotic counting formula due to those particular authors, Duke, Rudnick, and Sarnak, 1993, where they say that asymptotic counting formula is related to a ratio, one on the volume of the fundamental domain. The fundamental domain is an arithmetic quantity that's uh, actually known. So in n equals 2, it's zeta function at 2, pi squared on 6. The remaining question is a random matrix problem question. How do we actually integrate a volume where we're choosing invariant measure? I have to define what the invariant measure means. On the space of matrices in SL, in the n equals 2 case, SL2R. So that's the question. We'll be answering it as we go along. The second problem I made mention of is this random lattice problem. Random lattice problem is uh, very much in the lineage of uh, invariant measures, as we'll, uh, as we'll see. So here's a picture of what was going on. V1 and V2 are our original basis vectors that we're spanning with an integer span. The question we would like to, to know is what is, uh, given V1 and V2 are actually chosen uniformly at random, in a sense that will be made clear in a moment, what is the distribution of the shortest basis vectors, U1 and U2? Very concrete question. Firstly, uh, you can see it. It's a question in geometry of numbers. Um, what about general dimensions? So n equals 2. n equals 2 hasn't necessarily got that much prestige in our random matrix community. The large n limits are usually uh, preferred, but um, still, n equals 2 is very good for drawing pictures. Here's n equals 2 again. Here is the third and final problem. This problem is not a number theory problem per se. It's a problem in uh, integral geometry or um, the um, geometrical uh, probability theory. So we've got a, a disk here. We're choosing three points uniformly at random. We're forming a triangle. We're asking about the statistical distribution of the area of that triangle. So here, you have denoted that area by delta, or uh, the region by delta, the volume of delta in general, the area. We could ask about moments, but let's uh, be happy to um, compute the average Moment. Now, I saw this remarkable formula and really got, got interested in this uh, topic because of this remarkable formula. Um, wanted to see, understand why we could get the binomial coefficients with n squares in there. <laughs> this is a result of Kingman. And I just sat down trying to actually compute this integral in the case n equals 2. So we can try that. Uh, we've got uh, how much time I've got left. Uh, see if we can do that in the next three quarters of an hour. It's an elementary integral in principle, but the method of computation is not elementary at all. Kingman's method. In fact, I read about this first in a old American um, American Math Monthly article, and uh, the question was posed. It wasn't answered except sort of a footnote to say that uh, I think the person's name was Clee. He was thanking uh, Kingman for a note saying that he knows how to do this, but he kept us all in suspense. It didn't explain how that might be done. So if I get time, I'll uh, say a little bit about uh, how some of our random matrix theory gives rise to an understanding of a computation of that sort. So this is moments of the volume of a convex hull of point. OK, so the very beginnings that I would like to talk about is one of the beginnings of random matrix theory. We can say there's a number of different beginnings. There is this beginnings of Hurwitz that's not uh, necessarily that high profile, the beginning in mathematical statistics, due to Wishart, a, math, a beginning in, uh, in theoretical physics um, due to Wigner, at least. There are those beginnings. So the beginning, due to Hurwitz, goes right back to the days where invariant theory was of interest. Hurwitz, um, following on from some famous work of Hilbert on a problem, finiteness problem, a particular um, notion relating to invariance of higher order polynomials, Hurwitz got to ask a similar question in the continuous setting. And he was led to the notion of a what Percy introduced earlier as the Haar measure, um, the invariant left and right measure with respect to the group action. And he did a number of calculations that are of just lasting interest, I think, in random matrix theory. I'd like to make that point as we go. So. Um, What's the notion here? The notion is the definition of this left and right invariant measure introduced, as I say, by Hurwitz some time ago. 
who it's actually gave a specification of that in terms of the volume element. So if we're taking orthogonal matrices, who its specification is to take this matrix R, orthogonal matrix, R transpose DR. The meaning of DR, I'll give an example over the page. How can one see that that's actually invariant? What do we mean? Well, we mean that central equation, but let's look here for a left invariant. So we take a fixed R naught, fixed orthogonal matrix, multiply on the left, we want to see that we actually, we want to see at all, we want to see that we get a, that our um, nominated volume form that we're claiming is invariant under left and right action, group action is actually unchanged. It's a very simple calculation using the fact that R naught is a member of the orthogonal group that that particular volume element's unchanged. So the, right, the correct combination, R transpose the R, that's fundamental. And it, we can form a calculus out of that. And here is an example. So we'll take a parameterization, and this is what Hurwitz did as well. And one could give a lecture, and Percy certainly over the years give a number of lectures relating to the use of Euler angles and generalizations for the, um, for the uh, permutation matrices, which is quite remarkable that it all goes through for permutation matrices structurally. I'm just taking the two by two case. So we're taking our standard parameterization of a rotation matrix and using the formalism to do a calculation of what that actual invariant measure is in these variables. So one finds that R transpose the R is an anti-symmetric matrix. The meaning of the volume element is that we take the product of the independent differentials there. Well, there's only d theta that is independent. So our actual volume element is d theta for a two by two orthogonal matrix. If we went to the two by two unitary matrix, we'd actually have uh, four variables. If we um, normalize the first and second uh, column to have a positive real first entry, we just go down to our two variables and um, we can do the same calculation. We can form u dagger du and then take the product of the independent differentials. It's slightly trickier here because we do have something on the diagonal, but that's something on the diagonal is repeated. We have another d alpha on the off diagonal. In fact, what we do in practice is multiply together the independent differentials, the real and imaginary part on the off diagonal only, just as we did it in the um, orthogonal case. So this is the two by two setting. Very concrete final expression here in terms of the Euler angles in both examples. One has to know how to parameterize a general orthogonal matrix for general N and a unitary matrix for general N in terms of Euler angles to proceed. Um, the first person to do that was actually Euler himself in the N equals three case. Excuse this uh, technical glitch. Um, and apparently in that paper, Euler sketched how to do this for general N. Hurwitz uh, repeated Euler's parameterization in the um, real case and in the, um, for the case of ON for UN, he uh, gave a generalization, was then able to give explicit <laughs> parameterizations of these volume forms for general N and as an application computed the volumes themselves. So I remember for our application for these asymptotic counting formulas, we want to compute volumes. Here is the very first volume calculation. So this is way back in 1897. Well, perhaps the next um, major development along this line was while in his book, 1939, on the classical groups. He introduced this notion of a class function, a function unchanged by conjugation by uh, orthogonal and, and unitary matrices. And for that purpose, he was interested in decomposing these invariant measures, not in terms of Euler angles, but in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So in his book, he uh, showed how to do such calculations. Technically, they're not necessarily that difficult. And one gets this well-known decomposition of measure that uh, somewhat underlie what I was sketching out over there, that we have this product of differences to some power. We have a factorization of this eigenvalue part and the eigenvector part. So the Vs here is our matrix of eigenvectors. So we see that invariant measure introduced by Hurwitz. V dagger dV appear in 
this particular calculation. This is where the Vs are, have indeed the first entry normalised to be positive. So we've actually got two lots of unitary matrices going on here where U dagger to U on the left and V dagger to V on the right. Slight subtlety, but that's um, Viles uh, calculation. In the 1940s, Siegel got interested in the, uh, well, had already been interested in the geometry of numbers. He wanted to introduce this no notion of a random lattice. So to introduce the notion of a random lattice, he wanted the vectors to be unchanged by all elements of GLNR. He wanted his um, measure to be invariant. So let's go back to the, don't even need to two-dimensional, can we go to the, the one-dimensional case and ask ourselves what measure is unchanged by multiplicative group action. So we want to replace x by alpha times x and have our measure unchanged. That, the answer to that would be dx divided by x. The matrix generalization, just isolated here by um, Siegel, very simple, is just dividing out by the absolute value of the determinant to the power of n. An example I just said was n equals 1. In the study geometry of numbers, these uh, lattice that uh, Seeger was interested in uh, forming at random, he normalised things so that a volume, a unit volume, a cell was equal to 1. And we know that the uh, determinant of the matrix, if we're thinking of the columns as defining the vectors, gives us the volume of a cell, parallel piped. So um, what one has to then do is go to a or well, sort of, a, I, I like to think of it as a, um, a distribution on this particular invariant measure that has a delta function when the determinant is equal to one. Now, since the determinant is equal to one, the factor that we saw in the denominator in that first displayed equation is no longer present, and it's replaced by this uh, singular distribution. Siegel did not actually use this same uh, formalism, but the calculation, calculation, in a calculation sense, it's actually equivalent. So Siegel had some interest, he, and I'll mention later in the talk, he, def he calculated or gave a, uh, a mean value theorem using this uh, formalism. Um, it'll come up later. <laughs> Continuing studies of the geometry of numbers, um, this guy Jack, who's well known to us studying uh, Jack McDonald polynomials, etc., and one of the collaborators uh, of a... Uh, um, Specialist at the time in the geometry of numbers, uh, this guy Macbeth, uh, they partnered together to calculate for a different purpose, but they did a calculation which now could be used and plugged into that formula of um, Duke et al. Because it is the actual volume where we make a truncation according to a certain norm. So our norm is chosen to be measured according to the largest singular value, so that's the operator norm. They show us how to compute the volume. So we know how to compute the volume of, by integrating out over the orthogonal matrices, that's Hurwitz's result. What remains is how do we actually do this computation over the singular values? And we have to perform this particular integral. And after many pages, they were able to perform that integral. Their purposes were very technical. They wanted to show some equivalence of a particular limiting process under Riemann integration as opposed to Lebesgue integration. They had very technical reasons, so they wrote a paper for that purpose. So they've got a different application in mind here. But before that, if you look back at their paper, it goes on many pages. And then if I flashed over it, to, didn't I say it at all? I didn't say it at all. Their final result is actually, we start with an n-dimensional integral, their final result is a single-dimensional integral. So that's the sort of, um, <laughs> my sort of stuff playing around with those integrations. Turns out integrals um, or techniques are about to, uh, to revise here, sort of come back into vogue, because there's some activity in uh, integral aspects of random matrix theory for random matrix products. And one of the technical tools there is using this Mellon transform. So how can we introduce the Mellon transform here in a way that allows us with just in a few lines to compute um, this integral, uh, go from this n-dimensional integral down to one-dimensional integral? What we can do is introduce a dummy variable t into the problem before we constrained our determinant to equal one. Let's now constrain our determinant to equal this free parameter t. 
And now we'll take a transform with respect to T, a Mellon transform, and the Mellon transform undoes the delta function for us. That's fine, and we know how to take an inverse Mellon transform. So if it happens that we're, by undoing the delta function, we've got a multi-dimensional integral that's well-structured, then we've made progress, and indeed, the R dependence in this multi-dimensional integral, multi-dimensional integral depends on S and R, the R dependence factorizes out, we're left with something that's very familiar and occurred many times in random matrix theory. It's a particular example of the Selberg integral. The Selberg integral, in turn, is evaluated in terms of products of gamma functions. So we've evaluated that multidimensional integral. We still get left with one integral because we have to take the inverse Mellon transform. So at the end of the calculation, we get a single integral. And that's good value. The um, application we have in mind is a large R the large R form of that, and the large R form of that is actually easy to, um, to compute. And we've gotten ourselves, if I uh, have the next, yes, it's uh, down the bottom there. We've gotten ourselves um, an actual prediction or, or corollary of knowledge of this, or an application, better still, of a knowledge of this particular uh, volume in, for the invariant measure of matrices in SLNR. To see, get a little bit better understanding of this result of um, Duke, Rudnick, and Sarnak, one has to know a little bit about the geometry of, um, let's again take the, the n equals 2 case, a very, very well known, famous uh, picture up there, the geometry relating to the quotient space. SLNR, SLN, SLNZ, when N2 is hyperbolic geometry in the upper half plane, where each of these particular regions is identical under this Mobius transformation. So the, the mappings of SL2Z themselves, basically each of these cells is, can be thought of as one of these particular matrices. So all we have to do is count up the number of cells within some region, but they're all equivalent. So we basically just <laughs> work out the total area and divide by a single cell, the area of a single cell. So that's the way of uh, thinking of their result. So it's a very natural result. N equals two, it's, um, it's not even too easy to find an elementary derivation of this. The final expression is that the number of matrices goes like six times R squared. So remember, R is the bound on the norm. It turns out you can look at diff different norms, and in the original paper of Duke et al., they consider the Frobenius norm. The here, this is the, oh, the operator norm. You still get the same answer in n equals two only. You get six, six times uh, R squared. That's the end of the first problem. The second problem, why we might be interested in exploring invariant measure following the lineage of um, Hurwitz, is this uh, smallest, shortest, lattice uh, problem. So let's um, get underway with that. I've stated the problem a few times. We can think of it as a minimization problem. The, if we, if we specialise to n equals 2, some sort of remarkable analogies with the um, diagram I put before relating to the upper half plane appear. So we need to get an understanding of criterion for our two vectors to be the shortest vectors that are basis vectors. And the key one is this uh, um, formula in the middle there, two times the absolute value of u dot v less than or equal to the absolute value of u squared. The other one is just saying that, um, that v is the second shortest vector and u is the shorter, well, there's an ordering in our two vectors. If we align this shortest vector u with the um, in the, we're considering these vectors in R2, we align that shortest vector along the x-axis. We look at those two inequalities. Those two inequalities actually give us exactly the same region as we saw for the fundamental domain in this hyperbolic geometry. And in fact, it's not too hard to um, go from those inequalities and uh, perhaps it'll become clearer when we go to a particular coordinate system and see that we get precisely the inequality. The inequalities that define the fundamental domain, um, the absolute value of this z has to be um, 
bigger than one and the absolute value of the real part has to be, uh, well, we can be less than or equal to, worrying about the boundary here, equal to a half. <laughs> this uh, second inequality here is actually precisely two times u dot v less than or equal to absolute value of u squared, provided we parameterize u in v you know, in a way that's going to come up on the, the next slide. So let's have a look at the next slide. How is our random matrix theory relevant to this uh, problem? Well, it's relevant because we have a natural, what did I say in that previous diagram? We wanted to rotate the shortest vector to a, long, a line along the x-axis. Naturally, the QR decomposition does that for us. This for, we're taking out two bases vectors, M11, M21 is, is one of them. That's the first column, second column. We're rotating by a two by two member of, of uh, SO2. And what we get left with, this is basically the, the Gram-Schmidt, what we get left with a triangular matrix. But these are, though, the correct coordinates to use for the problem I just described. The vector we just aligned along the x-axis is actually R110. The second shortest lattice vector, basis vector, is R12. And actually, it's 1 on R11 because we require the determinant to equal 1. We've said we're normalizing things to determine to equal to 1. It's, um, yeah, well, it's, uh, we can generalize that. So I've been just for descriptive purposes talking about the n equals 2 case, but this works for, uh, for general n. At least this part of the calculation works for general n. What doesn't work for general n is an easy way to, to describe these inequalities here. Uh, we've only described the shortest lattice basis vectors for n equals 2. And it's, it's these particular inequalities, which I say, are strictly equivalent to the inequalities that we see in the upper half uh, hyperbolic model geometry, upper half plane model of hyperbolic geometry. What might one be interested in here? Well, one might be interested in the distribution of the shortest lattice vector because where our original basis vectors are at random, our shortest vector, lattice vector will be described by a probability density function. And that calculation is relatively elementary. The, we're just integrating over R1, 2. It's the, observe, it's the coordinate we don't observe. We observe the coordinate R11. No big deal. We have a particular domain to integrate over. And uh, something we're fairly familiar with in random matrix theory, we get some linear repulsion. We see linear repulsions, of course, in uh, this circular orthogonal ensemble, beta equals 1, very characteristic of beta equals 1. They're chosen with uniform measures, so that's a very important point. So the generated, the original vectors are chosen at random with respect to the invariant measure for SLNR. We have to then normalize things so that we have less than or equal to R. So that's the notion of Siegel. We want to choose, a, what does it mean to have a random lattice? It means that our, our basis vectors are unchanged by all group actions of SLNR, and that is the invariant measure. So there's a unique variant measure. It's not normalizable. We had to cut off the absolute value, or the, the, in, in the case I considered uh, the largest singular value. It doesn't, that cutoff does not show itself in the final calculation. You don't require a cutoff, as it turns out. It's, um, point I haven't uh, tried to uh, attempted to discuss here, but there is no, no need to have the cutoff in the final calculation. That's in the, in the conceptual underpinnings of the calculation. We get this linear repulsion in the sense, not really repulsion because it's just a distribution of the shortest lattice vector, but um, it's, uh, it's linear. So that's sort of something that we've seen in random matrix theory for other reasons, let's say. What's this number four thirds to the power of one quarter? That comes about if the geometry of a triangular lattice. That's an extreme. The best packing is the triangular lattice case. The second shortest lattice vector doesn't start till s equals one. What's the s equals one significance? That's a square lattice. So that's when the shortest and the longest, uh, the shortest, yeah, and the second, <laughs> the other um, basis vectors are actually equal to each other. Now, to um, perhaps better illustrate that the setup of this, one can do a numerical experiment. 
So we want to choose our basis vectors from the sample from the invariant measure, where we put some bound on the operator norm of the matrices. We know how to do that. We go back to our singular value decomposition to do that. So we know how to sample um, uniformly at random from Haar measure. Percy um, gave us some, some details in uh, his talk. And it's n equals 2. One can explicitly sample from the distribution specifying the um, singular values. If n is not equal to 2, one can do a Monte, Car Monte Carlo calculation. So we can easily sample uniformly at random with this particular bound. What we need then next to do is use other knowledge of how one computes the shortest lattice vectors. And that's classical algorithm due to Lagrange and Gauss in another setting, in the setting of quadratic forms. And it's a very easy, it's very elementary, uh, the idea behind it. You take uh, you take your original vectors, order them so that u is in, in length less than v, and try and create this red vector. You cannot actually create this red vector, the uh, orthogonal projection or the com orthogonal component of the orthogonal projection, because in our lattice we are only allowed to use integer linear combinations. So what you do is form the closest integer. This is exactly the same as minimizing v minus m times u, the norm of v minus m times u. What value of m gives the smallest length? It's precisely this projected, very familiar projection um, quantity from this geometrical uh, procedure of very familiar from Gram-Schmidt. And just repeat that algorithm. That's uh, the way it goes. It's very closely related to the the greatest common denominator divisor algorithm, actually. You can see that, but I won't attempt. Um, and then you can uh, compare the theoretical predictions against um, the numerics. And the first two, shortest lattice vector, the uh, second shortest basis vector, and this third graph here is a prediction for the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So that all works uh, very well for, for n equals 2. OK. I'll now just briefly um, say, well, no, one more thing. As I sort of said, n equals 2 perhaps not very prestigious. <laughs> Can one actually do calculations for general n, which I've now changed to d here? You can say a little bit about the general n case because one has this tool, the uh, Siegel's um, mean value theorem in this geometry of numbers. So he says that if one wants to average a function over all lattice points, provided that the lattices themselves are chosen uniformly at random, then it's just the same thing as averaging the function. Now, if one takes the function to be the indicator function of a ball of radius r, you can make some predictions relating to the shortest lattice vector. So I run through a little bit of a calculation here. The end of the day, it gives a prediction for what the small s behavior should be of this shortest lattice vector. Very simple calculation, and it gives a prediction that this particular um, coefficient relates to the Riemann zeta function uh, because of this interesting calculation. How do you integrate 0 to 1 where you've got 1 on s, you're taking the integer part? This 1 on s just comes about as a number of s here is to be thought of the length of the shortest lattice vector. r divided by s is the number of multiples of that shortest lattice vector you can have up to the value r. And then we're multiplying that by the distribution of the shortest lattice vector. So that's the content. C is our unknown here. But since we know the values of the left-hand side, that's just the volume of the unit ball, we can work out what C has to be. And if one superimposes that prediction for the small s behavior over an exact calculate, numerical calculation, a right, uh, numerically exact um, sampling, and then lattice reduction, that's an interesting point in itself. Lattice reduction is a non-trivial task. For d equals 2, 3, and 4, it can be done in polynomial time exactly. Beyond that, one only has available approximate, um, approximate, what's it called, LLL algorithm, a very famous algorithm, but it's very approximate <laughs> in the sense it's <laughs> exponentially far away. It can be exponentially far away from the shortest lattice vector as the dimension increases. But 
up to, up to four dimensions, there is a polynomial time natural extension of the Lagrange Gauss algorithm. If one does superimpose that prediction here involving the Riemann zeta function uh, evaluated at three, one finds very you know, good agreement up to um, uh, around about you know, 0.3 or something, uh, even though this is supposed to now just be the very first term in a, an expansion, still, uh, still uh, uh, exhibited in the numerical data. And the prediction is that that's the case for general uh, D. In the limit that D goes to infinity, this problem um, in some sense becomes less interesting because you get a Poisson process for all the uh, different uh, lengths of the basis vectors. There is some sort of decoupling. Okay, my uh, final point, which I won't uh, go over in, in too great detail, but it's of interest um, from the random matrix perspective because it's now making use of a different decomposition. We started off with a decomposition, the Euler decomposition of the orthogonal matrices. We then made use of singular value decompositions. We made use of the uh, QR decomposition. And his final um, subtopic, the decomposition that is relevant is actually the polar decomposition. So the polar decomposition is closely related to the singular value decomposition. And I have a, a little bit of um, discussion there. What we want to do is decompose our uh, general rectangular matrix in terms of a, what's our, our Q? It's going to be um, a unitary, a, a real orthogonal matrix, but times, is that correct there? I've got to get this right. Um, N by N and V itself, N by N. So it's not actually, so U times V transpose, yeah, I think it's N by N, I think that's correct. Um, multiplied by a symmetric matrix. So that's, that's the difference. It's just a little manipulation of the singular value decomposition. We know how to change variables. We know what the Jacobian is for this um, particular decomposition. What's the, where is this sort of particularly heading? Why are we interested in this um, particular subtle difference from what we saw before? with the QR decomposition. We're interested in this because we have a different problem in mind. The different problem is the one from integral geometry of giving some statistical information about the distribution of the volume of this uh, simplex. So and it's this subtle, subtle difference. OK, so let me continue on. <laughs> I got, as I say, interested in this problem because I wanted to know how one could actually compute that formula of Kingman. And uh, I was doing reading a lot of the literature and I just came across this particular, <coughs> how is it, now it's uh, doing it on its own. Uh, who knows, uh, excuse that, so how to, okay, where are we? Yeah, we're up to that slide. Next slide here. Yeah, I came across this particular paper in uh, the local, one of the local journals, let's say, the uh, Bulletin of the Australian Math Society. Um, what this paper did was relate the polar decomposition, which um, we might come across in our random matrix theory, to a key integration, a key decomposition of measure in the integral geometry. So I just like to um, lead towards that particular decomposition of measure. It's that particular decomposition of measure that Kingman at least implicitly uh, rediscovered and made use of in his, um, his calculation. So from the polar decomposition, we can write for ourselves an integration formula. Uh, now it's uh, clear to me what I was stumbling over before. This um, space of matrices used is actually in this stifle manifold. So it's not actually um, unitary matrices. We have n by n. So we have each of the individual columns are mutually orthogonal, but we don't have uh, as many columns as there are rows. So um, 
That's this dipole manifold, so it's subtly different. We have um, our positive definite matrices, so the polar decompositions, um, the second part of the polar decomposition is uh, symmetric matrices, so we have here a positive definite, I should say, matrices. I didn't emphasize that before on the previous slide, I should have. The positive definite matrices, all eigenvalues are, are positive. So um, that's our, our starting point. One of Mogadishu's, Mogadishu's um, observations is that if you use this formula twice, you get this is sort of a very subtle point, sort of a magic trick of Percy there. If you use this twice, you get a formula that, um, that is of interest in random matrix theory because it goes between um, a distribution on, say, a Geneva matrices, rectangular Geneva matrices, n by, small n by big N, to a distribution on n by n matrices. And this is something that in this uh, interest of having uh, random matrix products has been um, quite useful. So uh, it's a very subtle change, but if you examine what that formula is saying, integration formula over rectangular matrices, integration formula over square matrices, is saying how they're related. They're related by this Jacobian factor. So that was already a bit of an um, interesting point that one can read into the workings of, uh, in that paper. One can, uh, these, uh, these sigma here is just some notation for the surface areas uh, that come in and integrating in this stifle manifold. <laughs> the uh, ingredient that goes beyond what one would do entirely from a random matrix perspective, perhaps, is this next step here, where one introduces the uh, Grasmannian. This Grasmannian, I, the concept here is that the space of subspaces, where each subspace is to be thought of as coming with a preferred basis, and it's a conceptual um, challenge of sorts to get a head around, but if we get a head around that, that particular way of thinking, we can, and we can introduce an invariant measure on this uh, space of Grasmannians. One can, with minor manipulation of the previous formula, deduce this decomposition of measure. This decomposition of measure is close to what is used uh, implicitly, at least, in Kingman's work. So it's not really too different to what we've seen before. We've just written into some different notation. We've certainly got the determinant of the matrix. So I'm thinking here of all the columns as defining vectors. That's how the people in the integral geometry think. We have a factor that's our determinant. We have this new invariant measure relating to this Grasmannians, whereas before we had an invariant measure either on a stifle manifold or on orthogonal matrices. So it's not too different. There's yet one other little step that one has to do. The formula is actually due to these two authors, Blasky, Petskanskin, and there's an affine version. One wants to make use of this affine version with some, a few subtleties, but it's very similar. We've got this preferred basis, and there is an extra coordinate that appears, this coordinate that I've denoted by R. And that's in a direction orthogonal to the column space of this, these preferred coordinates B. And that's really, if one reads Kingman's paper, the essential idea that he introduces this orthogonal direction. So if you try to do that integration I mentioned at the very beginning, what is the average area of a triangle in a disk? I don't think it can be done elementarily, in an elementary way without this insight that, that Kingman was able to, um, to give to the problem. How can we see that this is useful for computing volumes of, of a simple, simplices? Well, we have in our determinant now not the determinant of the original matrix that has its columns V. We have this combination of a fixed uh, vector subtracting off each of these. And that's exactly the formula for the um, volume of a triangle, for example, you have to, well, it's one of the formulas for the volume of a triangle if we have our three um, points denoted uh, 
V1, V2, V3 in the plane, then A formula for the area relates to the determinant of the difference, say V3 minus V1 as a column and V2 minus V1 as a column, and the absolute value of that determinant. So this is uh, exactly what we want, and that's exactly what this particular decomposition of measure that appeared uh, in the classical literature that was sort of rediscovered by, um, by Kingman, at least implicitly, shows us. The interesting development that I try to emphasize there is that this is really can be viewed from a random matrix perspective from this um, polar decomposition. All right, that's uh, about all I want to say. There is quite a, a few ongoing uh, aspects of this. One ongoing aspect is in our random matrix theory, I've, I've particularly in this talk really been talking about the beta equals one case, the real entries, but we could ask about the invariant measure on SLNC, or we could ask about the invariant measure on SLNH, where H are the quaternions. <laughs> Once we've gotten that, we're sort of starting off being able to perhaps answer some counting questions, asymptotic counting questions of the sort posed by um, Duke et al. We need a quotient space, so if we take uh, SLNC, the natural quotient space perhaps, is the Gaussian integers. So we're now going to do lattice reduction where, where our integers are Gaussian integers. Well, actually, do we only have to work with Gaussian integers? When we're in the two-dimensional case, we could perhaps work with other families of integers like Eisenstein integers, for example. From, turns out, it would seem, from the calculations of doing to date, that any integers that have a generalized integers that have that the Euclidean algorithm works for, that we actually can do division and get a smaller remainder. That seems to be really very much the mechanism. We did calculations that relate to um, the distribution in the two-dimensional case. Can we do those calculations, as I say, for SL2C? Well, yes, we can do those calculations, and I have a student working on that, and we can compute, for example, what's interesting even to compute the fundamental domain, the volume of the fundamental domain is fairly challenging there. It involves the Catalan uh, constant, for example, and as well as the Riemann zeta function. Um, that's done if one moves on to the, to the quaternions, um, a little bit more difficult because these Lipschitz integers don't, do not form a Euclidean domain. You have to go to something called the Hurwitz integers. Um, makes it a little bit technically more difficult. What I haven't said that uh, is also very interesting about this random lattices problem is that this is all very closely related to um, continued fractions. Firstly, the problem in um, that I've been talking about in this talk, two-dimensional real case, is closely related to continued fractions in the complex plane. If one looks at this a problem that uh, already made a fair bit of progress on, uh, SL2C, the continued fractions are now themselves quaternions. So you actually go up to uh, the quaternions if you look at the complex case, and there's some, um, quite a bit of geometry relating to all of this that I believe is uh, a topic that's uh, fairly rich. Um, it's also quite fascinating that um, the line I've been taking is uh, begun by Hurwitz in the 1890s. Hurwitz is the person who proved that the only normed real division algebras are the real numbers, the complex numbers, and the quaternions, if we require them to be also associative. So that's something that we Dyson threefold way that's very important to us in random matrix theory. One of Hurwitz's other interests, even before the, uh, his main result uh, in the 1897 paper, was complex continued fractions. So there is three <laughs> interests of Hurwitz that, uh, well, over 100 years later, are uh, quite prominent in uh, following uh, this particular line of random matrix theory. So thank you. Any questions?
Jesus, I saw Roger Miles' name up. So he got higher moments? Yeah, that's very much the, exactly right, uh, Percy. So um, what Miles noticed was that to underpinning Kingdom's calculation was this particular decomposition of measure due to to Blasky, Penkarskin, and then he was able to extend the calculation by computing all of the moments. Very much that's exactly right. Were there nice limiting distributions or no? Well, then that's, uh, yeah, so once you know all the moments, you can take, uh, you can try and uh, compute the limiting distribution. In some, some cases, that was actually done, uh, and it involves, it's a little bit like the problem in random matrix theory of asking about what is the limiting distribution for finite n, of a determinant. It's very much in that class of problems. So the determinant case, so if we took our Gaussian um, GOE sort of problem, GUE problem, an interpretation of what we're doing there is computing a volume of a um, parallel piper that's pinned at the origin. What I showed that, that Kingman did, he didn't have his um, simplex pinned at all. It was moving around. That's an interpretation of the average or moment of the determinant. Then you can ask the question for finite n, what is the distribution from knowledge of the, all the moments? Then you can, can write that in terms of Maya g function and that's uh, how things all go around because Maya g functions is what... This, another line of random matrix theory of present interest of integrable properties of products of random matrices. Uh, Maya g function is very prominent. so. Perhaps that was another reason why I was looking in this direction, uh, interested in that sort of side of things. <laughs>